G'day humans, welcome to We The People Live, the discussion show for planet Earth, the place that makes debate healthy again. I am your host, Josh Zepps. Today, I wish this uh, were longer, I wish it were a longer conversation. Kyle Kalinske is a, a talk show host, he has a show on uh, uh, the, well it's an affiliate of the Young Turks Network, his YouTube show is called Secular Talk. He has over a half a million subscribers, he has almost a half a billion video views over 120,000 followers on Twitter, all by articulating a very passionate defence of the left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, I could have spoken, like I say, for two, uh, for two or three hours with him about all kinds of things, but we try to hopscotch around a bunch of things that are in the political ether, and I think he's an interesting representative, although he and I don't agree on everything, but he's an interesting representative of one way of approaching uh, political reason at the moment and of opposing what we might regard as the forces of darkness and evil... Uh, in a way that articulates a very passionate and robust and ballsy vision of the left. I won't speak for him. I will let him speak for him. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Karl Kalinske. This is We the People Live. Kyle, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is a good opportunity for me to talk to as many other uh, people who have been buzzing around the pod sphere, uh, new media world on both sides of the political aisle. Because we all seem so hunkered down into our political camps that I want to understand how other people are thinking about the current political moment. Can you give people who may be only vaguely aware of you a snapshot of where you, you, you sit? Oh, sure. Um I mean, I would describe my politics as populist left. Um, you know, a more uh, probably a simpler way to explain that is uh, I'm sympathetic to social democracy. So that means that uh, in the context of the U.S., I would be left of the Democratic Party on economic issues and uh, feel kind of stranded and lonely on the national scene. I mean, there are some people who represent. <laughs> What do you mean? You've just had that... a huge primary win in New York City, haven't you, with this uh, this this barnstorming young Latina woman who has knocked off the uh, the old fuddy duddy guy in the Democratic Party? Well, that's right, and that's actually uh, she's uh, one of the first Justice Democrats, and I was a co-founder of that group, Justice Democrats. So we have had some wins, that's for sure. But you know, nationally, you have Bernie Sanders in the Senate, Elizabeth Warren half the time. And then, yeah, like you mentioned, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who will be going to Congress. And you have Ro Khanna in Congress, Raul Grijalva. So there's a few. Maybe I'm overstating it. And but, sorry, what is this justice group that you were talking about? Uh, it's called Justice Democrats. And mm -hmm. basically the idea was to get Bernie Sanders-style Democrats to take over the Democratic Party and, you know, pretty much get the Democratic Party off of corporate money is the gist of it and mm -hmm. get them to be more like old school FDR New Deal style Democrats. What about the predictable response that you must get all the time, which is that the the fundamental reality is that voters in America are center right people. They are not Danes. Uh, they have never uh, voted successfully for candidates. Well, not in the past half century for candidates who espouse the kind of progressive views that that you embrace. Uh, they've only gone for Democrats when they're quasi sort of blue dog Democrats like Bubba Clinton and. Uh, and even to some extent Obama, who tried to pave this very, very centrist way, and maybe you think that it blew up in his face, but enough Americans think that he was too far left that they're never going to jump on your bandwagon. So that's a great question. Um, it turns out that that narrative, which is the predominant narrative in U.S. politics among Democratic strategists, is just factually incorrect. So when you look at um, the past few decades, actually, in Democratic politics, you find very quickly that this notion that you know, kind of uh, centrist Democrats who are okay with corporate money and willing to be a part of the establishment, uh, they've gotten their butt handed to them. I'm saying butt when I normally say another word. I don't know if I could curse on your show. So you I'm sure can. To... Go for it. What okay. are we, what have they, well, what's they been handed to them? Asses handed to them. <laughs> Ass is, Ass is actually quite a quaint and polite word for the level of this show. So that's, uh, you're, you're in good company. Well, we're going we're gonna to start with us and we can gradually, uh, we can gradually graduate up to cunt. We'll, we'll we'll break it right now. They, they, these guys got their fucking asses handed to them, <laughs> and um, yeah, so they lost a thousand seats using this philosophy, you know. And under Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Barack Obama, what do you mean by course, a thousand seats? Over what period of time are we talking about? 
uh, under their leadership. So you go from Barack Obama being so actually it predates Obama too. So say 2004 until uh, today, mm. you've had the Democrats lose because they had a supermajority under Obama, and then it was squandered very quickly. And if yeah, you but the reason at, surely the reason it was squandered. I mean, what's wrong with the narrative that the reason it was squandered is because he tried the most progressive overhaul of healthcare that had ever been attempted. Oh. In, another it, great question. Yeah, that's in the another United great States. question. So that that caused uh, the, the twenty ten uh, the, the twenty ten backlash of the tea, well, and the correct, tea, the right of the tea party. My response to that is he actually didn't try the most progressive overhaul. In fact, he did the Heritage Foundation's plan. The sure, Heritage Foundation. Yeah, yeah. No, so there, I guess there are two there are two points here that it's worth not conflating. One is uh, what was the actual policy, and the other is what was correct. the rhetoric around the backlash to the policy that led the Democrats to suffer an electoral defeat. So the actual well, see, policy, exactly I agree with you, was a sort of fairly moderate Republican market based uh, policy. But there's but it's ridiculous to imagine, I think, that had it been a full blooded Medicare for all policy, that the chance of get your government hands off our healthcare system, this is a government takeover of healthcare. Uh, and especially given that the the medical establishment wouldn't have been on side for that, whereas they were on side for uh, for Obamacare, the very powerful doctors' lobby, and so on. It, I, I can't imagine how the backlash would have been less. Well, I mean, it's easy to imagine it actually when you look at the polls today, because for example, over sixty percent of the American people today support Medicare for all. And the game changer on that front was, of course, Bernie Sanders actually uh, bothering to make an argument. See, that's the thing that's annoyed me for so long about the Democratic Party, and that's why we did Justice Democrats. It's one of many reasons, but they they never fought and they never actually believed in the ideas that they were supposed to believe in if they if they actually were part of this um, strain of thought along with uh, FDR's New Deal philosophy. So basically, the point is they've abandoned their roots. Now, remember, you got to remember, FDR, um, the Republicans had to come up with term limits to try to make sure— that <laughs> we'd never get another situation like they were in because FDR was so wildly popular that they're like, we literally just can't beat this guy. Hmm. And he was kind of a, a run-of-the-mill social democrat. And uh, I'm of the belief that, and of course the polls reflect this today, but even at times where the polls do not reflect it, and I think you do have an argument on that front the further back you go, so around like you know 2008, 2009, uh, Medicare for all was not over 50 percent. But my whole point all along was that we need to have Democrats who are educating the public and willing to make strong arguments in favor of things that they should value. Mm. And again, to bring back Bernie Sanders, he he did a fantastic job pointing out the basic fact that every other developed country has one version or another of a single payer system and that we're lagging behind the rest of the world on this front. And that's just an empirical fact. You can't argue against it. So the thing that's annoyed me is that, you know, the more the right shrieks endlessly about how, like you mentioned, oh, Obamacare is this government takeover of healthcare and it's terrible and they have death panels. And uh, if we had strong populist left Democrats, the response to that could have been, we already have death panels. It's called Blue Cross Blue Shield and Humana. It's called for-profit health insurance companies. So... That's basically all, all I'm asking for, all Justice Democrats is asking for. We want Democrats to be what they should have been all along, and we're also uh, – I, I'd be willing to guarantee better election results because when you have strong social Democrats willing to make an argument and argue for ideas that are actually all, already overwhelmingly popular – you tend to win. Mm. I think where you and I see totally eye to eye is that e even if we put aside the electoral plausibility of the ideas that you're putting forth being popular right now, there is a long-term game that the Republicans have been playing, which is let's just shift the the uh, the kind of parameters of the discourse. You know what the what the geeks call the Overton window, the meaning the this, the kind of window in which an idea is regarded as being uh, a legitimate thing for for discussion amongst sensible people, and yep. uh, things like you know abolishing the EPA would 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 have just been insane. Uh, they wouldn't. Have, you would have been laughed out of the room uh, uh, even just twenty or thirty years ago. I mean, it was Nixon who created the EPA. Now they are popular punchlines at Republican primary 
debates. And so the audacity of pushing as far out as you can and, and defending the most extreme position in the knowledge that you're never going to quite get that probably, but, you, but you're certainly going to get a better deal than you would have if you'd started by being meek and modest. I mean, this I think everyone now agrees that this was Obama's kind of frustrating failure, that he would always go into positions assuming the best of his opponents and, and beginning with an opening gambit that was quite weak and tolerant of the other side's considerations, at which point the Republicans would scream <laughs> and uh, call him a, a socialist, communist, Kenyan, and that you, he'd end up with something that was halfway between his moderate position and their extreme position. Whereas if he'd gone exactly. in with an opening game, yep. but that was extreme, you could have ended up somewhere halfway between the two. So, yeah, I think even if it, even if I'm right that there is no actual electoral consensus for Medicare for All right now, I agree with you that it makes sense for the Democrats to have some spine and articulate positions that are considerably to the left of the ones that they've traditionally embraced, simply so that they're in a stronger position to negotiate something halfway there. So the only part of that uh, analysis that I would disagree with is just the point that, uh, I mean, every poll I've seen within the past two years has shown Medicare for all way over 50%. I think uh, that I just don't analysis... trust pol polls as much as you do, Kyle. I think that when you oh, actually okay. get into the rough okay. and tumble, no, no, like I think, enough, I, think, I think if you call someone while they're having dinner and you say, do you think everyone should have free health care from the government? They're like munching on a lamb chop and they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. And then when you get into the rough and tumble of a political campaign where your opponents are spending, you know, literally hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars that are coming from uh, medical device manufacturers and the doctor's lobby and all of that running scare campaigns about a government takeover, then whether or not they actually vote for the candidate who is proposing that thing is a different question. Well, yeah, and I think that, again, a another p part that ties into that is how effective are they at making an argument? I mean, that's another part of politics. It's kind of a lost art in politics. It's the idea of being able to sell your ideas in a way that's actually effective. And I mean, I know this is a perhaps an awkward time to bring up Trump because he doesn't really have a coherent philosophy and that goes without saying. But as far as being a salesman and and marketing and being repetitive and going on the offense, mm. um, I think he's actually a political genius in that respect. Yeah, I would also actually dispute what you just said, that, that you said it goes without saying that he doesn't have a coherent uh, political philosophy. I, I think part of his success and part of what has baffled uh, people who crave a certain level of intellect and uh, competence in politics and what is so aggravating to Trump's critics like us is that we can't see what the his coherent political philosophy is, but through a series of sort of subtle dog whistles and also not at all subtle bombastic tweets. His political philosophy is quite clear to the people who who dig it. And I think it's it's something like we've been being stabbed in the back forever. It's a pretty it's a pretty common political philosophy amongst uh, populists and authoritarians, actually. We've been being stabbed in the back forever by effete namby-pambies who don't have the backbone to stand up for our own interests. And we've been sold down the river in deals that are stitched up between K Street lobbyists in Washington and uh, Wall Street financiers. I'm the only guy who's actually independent, doesn't, take to, doesn't need to take swamp money like the rest of them. So let's make this country great and start looking after numero uno. Uh, instead of uh, prancing around the the world in on Air Force One like the the black guy, the last black guy did, selling out selling out our coal industry for to to Euro fags and and pussies and climate uh, hy hysterics, uh, you know it's time to it's time to to grow up. And I think like every everything that he does is suffused with that. Whether it's locking children in cages, separating them from their families at the border, it's like. Now the grown-ups are in charge. You, we're not, we're not going to be. We're not, there's no more Mister Nice Guy. Like we are, we are going to defend ourselves, and we're going to put ourselves first. And if you're a different color, and if you're foreign, and if you're if you're from a different political philosophy, then you can eat shit and die. Because like America got great by by being great, not by fucking singing Kumbaya and being and being Denmark. Like that to me is his overarching political philosophy, and it's as bright and as clear to me as a Trump sign on top of a skyscraper. See, the funny thing is that, like, I remember his closing political ad. I actually thought it was really good in that it was hard hitting and he really tried to make this case that it's like, kind of like you touched on there, it's me versus the establishment. It's me versus the elites, which is, you know, a theme that people across the political spectrum could actually relate to. And they think, yeah, you know, I have gotten a rough deal and I don't think people on Wall Street and in Washington, D.C. are looking out for me. But then the reason why I said, you know, I can't really ascertain a a clear uh, political philosophy from him or coherent political philosophy from him is that as far as I could tell, Josh, he's done the bidding of 
the establishment. I mean, look at his tax bill, for example. You know, it, it cut the corporate tax rate from 31% to 25%. Uh, it gutted the estate tax and raised it from uh, applying to people with over $5 million in net worth to over $11 million in net worth. And we can go down the list here. I mean, all of the, the deregulatory actions, the fact that he's appointing people to head agencies that basically don't want those agencies to exist, whether it's the EPA or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, I mean, in many ways, Trump to me actually seems like a, a his actions, his policies are very much like a, a standard establishment Republican. He's just a, an establishment Republican plus mean tweets, mm. which of no, course but that's the mean important. Tw- that's important, Kyle, because it depends how you define establishment. You define the establishment in the way that uh, I think a, a reasonable progressive person defines the establishment, which is very rich, powerful people, very very rich old white guys who run things. But his base regards the establishment as cult- as a cultural thing, not so much an economic thing. Uh, and I think his base, like the, it's, it's often been observed by Western European uh, analysts, that, that the, the peculiar thing about Americans is that they, they all think they're going to be rich. Like even if it doesn't end up happening, they all like sure. rich guys. Everyone, everyone in America, this whole ethos of the land of opportunity and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, like no matter how many times you you look at the economic numbers and you see that social mobility from like the bottom quintile to the top quintile in the United States is far lower than it is in other countries that have more progressive policies. There's still this this widespread American belief that it is the place where anything is possible. And to give credence to that point of view, that is somewhat true because it is hard to imagine and Obama coming out of nowhere and becoming the prime minister of Germany or Australia. It wouldn't happen because there are too many too many impediments in their path. And it's hard to imagine an Oprah Winfrey being an Oprah Winfrey in another country. But these are extreme outliers. And the, the mere fact that America facilitates the rise of extreme outliers like them or Elon Musk or something like that doesn't mean that it's a more egalitarian place. That's all just a slight aside to, to say I agree with your point about you're baffled that he has just gone in and he is like playing in the swampiest swamp that there's been in our living memory. I mean, I can't remember an administration that was so swampy. If you regard the establishment as being rich shitpokes who don't want the government to interfere in their business. But if you like rich shitpokes and you empathize with their desire for the government not to poke their nose in your business and your definition of the establishment is government bureaucrats who are who have never done anything in the real world in their lives and are just writing re- regulations that make industry less competitive and that sell America down the stream and make your life harder by raising taxes and increasing paperwork. And if you see people going in there with their swords, and even if they are a bit dirty like Scott Pruitt, they're, cut, they're slashing away at things and making life easier for the, for the men who really built this country, and I say men advisedly because I think there's a lot of sexism in this worldview as well, then Trump is anti-establishment because he's anti he's anti regulators, he's anti pipsqueaks, and he's anti all of these cultural effete transgender uh, you know, pussies who have who have got too many TV shows and who applaud each other too much at the at the Oscars. Like if if that's your conception of the establishment, then I understand his worldview. Does that make sense? Dude, that is that is a wonderful point. I've never that never once occurred to me, but when you said I'm talking, of course, about the establishment in an economic sense, and they're talking, he's talking about the establishment in a cultural sense. I had a light bulb moment, and I went, oh, that puts a lot of stuff in perspective. Because mm. I always, I, you know, it drives me nuts every time. Like, when I'm prepping for my show, sometimes I'll go, um, like, I'll watch some of Alex Jones stuff and cover whatever crazy rantings he's on. Mm. And I, I, I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm going, I don't understand how this guy can like basically dedicate every show he does to talking about how awesome Trump is while at the same time saying, you know, maintaining this position of I'm anti-establishment. It's like, dude, you are a cheerleader for the Republican party. The Republicans have the presidency, they have the Senate, they have the house, they have most uh, state legislatures, they have most governors. Uh, they they are the biggest supporters of the moneyed interests in this country. How on earth can you frame this as you being anti-establishment, you being <laughs> anti-elitist? Yeah. And I think you just touched on it. It really it, they don't think about it in the same. Uh, they, I mean, they obviously don't think about it in the same sense that I would think about it. Mm. Where I'm being quite literal in an economic sense. They look at it like, who, you know, the people who are dominant in cultural circles, mm. you know, and. It, Let's be honest here. When it comes to like Hollywood, for example, 
it, they look at those people and they look at you know whatever singers Absolutely. they look at actors the and New they York Times, that the, as like the oh, New you're Yorker, the establishment the and Trump's against you yeah. and I'm not in the cool club and Trump that's okay because Trump is gonna fight for me against you the evil cool people who are driving our culture off a cliff. Mm. I think that's I think that's definitely part of it and I mean just look at Fox News's constant narrative of victimization and how it always feels like, it always portrays conservatives as if they're on the outer and 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 it, it really signal boosts to use the jargon uh, every single instance of campus you know leftist uh, ex- excess uh, in right. order to in order to imply that the hegemony of the mainstream leftist culture is oppressive and out of control and it's a plucky little upstart that's trying to fight back against this this hegemony and this is why it concerns me a little bit and maybe we can move on to this this subject about how tactically the left should respond culturally um, we've had this conversation about, and the last episode of my podcast was also about civility, you know, about kicking out Trump uh, em- administration officials from restaurants and so on, and this kind of bullshit hypocrisy that the Republicans have been going on about, about how uh, how unfair that is and how we all have to be civil when we've got the most uncivil uh, president in the White House, uh, m- perhaps ever. And yet, I do think that just strategically it's a mistake to provide any fodder, any any fuel on the fire of this raging uh, kind of Fox News, Alex Jones machine and giving them instances to point to of us being hysterical and irrational and and nasty and, and that if we're going to win over potentially winnable but flirtatious with Trump centrist voters, not Trump not Trump's base. We're not going to win them over. But like, and you know, the seventy thousand people who just happened to vote for him in three swing states that gave him the, the presidency. If we're going to win them over, we have to appear like the grown ups in, in the room and not play into this idea that we are that cultural establishment that's disdainful towards and aggressive towards, um, conservatives. Do, how do you think we we need to play this hand? So I have um I have very mixed feelings on. Um, the few instances we've seen of, like you said, like Sarah Huckabee Sanders being kicked out of a restaurant, for example. I mean, on the one hand, you think, well, listen, if if shaming all of these public officials who are engaged in all these hideous policies actually might have an effect in that it prevents them and or makes them think twice the next time they want to implement another shitty policy. I see that and I go, well, if it's effective, I can kind of see. But then on the other hand, I I totally agree with the point you just made, which is, uh, it's kind of, actually, I don't know if you made this point, but I'll say it. It, It's, (laughs) it is somewhat hypocritical. I mean, even though I know you said like, oh, it's uh, bullshit hypocrisy or that Fox News is calling it hypocrisy, but it might not necessarily be hypocrisy. I don't know. It is a little bit hypocritical because once you open that door to, okay, I'm going to kind of discriminate over political ideology here. Well, you know what? It's immediately going to be be flipped back on the left, and then you're going to have some DSA meeting in Mississippi, and some restaurant owner in Mississippi is going to say, we don't serve your kind around here, and then how can anybody on the left uh, in good faith stand up and go, I'm against uh, discriminating over political affiliation? Mm. So I don't know. It just seems like a bad road to go down, but I do have mixed feelings on it overall. But to the broader question— I think that the way to win this culture war, war, if you will, is to just point out the basic reality that there are social justice warriors on the right, too. So, like, that's their that's their trump card at the moment, no pun intended, using Trump there. Mm. That's their trump card, the right. And that's, uh, you know, an issue that becomes a gateway to the right for many young people, young men, is that they see, you know, these unhinged— uh, kids on college campuses with pink hair trying to de-platform Ben Shapiro or something like that. And they think, well, I mean, obviously the left is totally irrational and that probably even extends to their economic worldview because just look at how they're acting, these crazy people. Mm. They keep trying to censor people. And listen, yeah, don't censor people, full stop. Like, don't do that. At the same time, we need to point out, Donald Trump tried to sue Bill Maher over a joke. Mm. Donald Trump tried to sue uh, the Onion because they wrote a satire piece about him that he didn't like. He constantly threatens, um, he threatens to change the libel laws in order to sue the media uh, easily. Mm. And you know there are just countless examples of the hyper victimization culture on the right as well. So I think the the most effective tool that we have in our toolbox to fight back against this 
is to just simply explain that there are right wing social justice warriors and they're not principled in a, in a, a stance on, on free speech. So mm. that allows them to see the hypocrisy of the right and go, OK, well, maybe I need to stop looking at this in a tribal way and think about what I actually believe on the issues. Yeah, I think that would I think that's a good that's a good point that uh, but but I also think that it'd be better if we could just stop being ridiculous on both <laughs> on both sides. But I take oh, your I point agree that, that if don't we get are me wrong, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want I don't want anybody deplatformed if they're going to give a speech at a college or something like mm, that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it because also it just becomes this this kabuki dance where you're playing into exactly what they want you to do like you know it was back when milo was a big hit the whole the whole point of milo was to to cause up to cause upset and outrage and and to provoke a backlash and so if you then if you play into that then you're doing you're dancing the dance that he wants you to dance and on a bigger scale this is what trump i think is doing to the left as well like he's manipulating us into into getting uh, f- foggy-headed about the targets of our outrage and and whipping people up into a into a frenzy, and I think the more we can avoid uh, responding like cats with a laser pointer to his latest provocation on Twitter, and the more we can focus very clearly on what we dislike about his administration, the corruption, the fact that he's not delivering for the people he said he was going to deliver for, and as you mentioned earlier, delivering for the Republican donor class and not for the for the regular guy, then I think that is going to be successful. Pardon the interruption, but I want to give you something for free. And you will love it if you've ever had to try to hire somebody. Hiring is hard. Well, it used to be. Multiple job sites to go through, stacks of resumes to look at, a confusing review process. Nowadays, thankfully, hiring is easy and you only have to go to one place to get it all done. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash people. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over a 100 of the web's leading job boards. And they don't stop there. They have powerful matching technology with which ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes and finds people with the right experience, then invites them to apply to your job. And as those applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes everyone and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash people. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash people. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned Milo there, and it makes them more powerful when you try to censor or deplatform. And I agree with you because if you focus on policy, if you focus on the substantive issues then I think that's a a sure way to win over voters and win people to your side more generally. And I find this trend now, um, it happens sometimes on the left, it happens definitely among Democrats. It's almost like they default to the laziest argument, and the laziest argument um, oftentimes happens to be a terrible argument. So just the other day uh, when Trump announced that Brett Kavanaugh is uh, his pick to be on the Supreme Court. The the Democrats' Twitter account um, said that I forget exactly what how it was worded, but basically their argument against him was uh, everybody who recommended him in a video in support of him was a man. <laughs> like that oh, that God. was their point. Social as justice a, alert. I mean, yeah, we're we're talking about a guy who. You know, he praised the dissent in Roe versus Wade. He thinks Obamacare is unconstitutional. He thinks the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is unconstitutional. Hmm. Um, Most terrifyingly that, to me, he, he thought that the illegal wiretapping that took place under the Bush administration after 9-11 is totally legit. Like, he's very much a, a believer in yes. strong executive power and doesn't really think the Fourth Amendment, which is... Or is it the third? What's unreasonable search and seizure? Fourth, fourth, the Fourth Amendment. Amendment. He doesn't really think that it's that big a part of the Constitution, seemingly. The, the, he thinks the executive has enormous latitude to, to search, search you without a warrant. So here you and I are, and in a matter of 45 seconds, we managed to craft like six or seven reasons <laughs> mm. why this guy would be terrible. But the Democrats defaulted to 
uh, a lot of men wanted him to be on the Supreme Court. Therefore, mm. he must be wrong. And that's the kind of stuff that turns people off to the left and and did you hurts us, Kyle? Did you also see there was a, there was a, a press release from I think it was the organizers of the Women's March, which was uh, the headline was like uh, Trump's outrageous uh, court nominee cannot be allowed to pass, and the first sentence uh, was Donald Trump today nominated, and, and then it was just XX. Uh, yes, and this, I saw that. And like, so like they haven't even filled in the name of the per- they've drafted it and then they haven't yep. they've they've published it and forgotten that they're supposed to insert insert name here. But their outrage is like at a level at eleven, regardless. So even if he had picked like another Sonia Sotomayor, apparently they would have been releasing yeah. this uh, anyway. So it's funny. it's cart before the horse. It's 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 partisan tribalism nonsense, and it uh, you know if if you're in the camp that wants to put the cart before the horse, maybe politics isn't for you because you come across looking absolutely silly and preposterous. Just on the question of, uh, on the point that you were making earlier about the right having its social justice warriors as well and its snowflakes. I don't know if you saw, but earlier this week, um, Sarah Palin found out that she had been hoodwinked by Sasha Baron Cohen, who the, the British actor who plays Borat and, uh, uh, and Ali G, and he pretended apparently to be a, uh, a a disabled veteran, and she thought that she was going to talk to a disabled veteran, and the interview just started going off the off the rails. And I tweeted when this came out. Uh, I'm looking forward to how chill the totally not snowflakes right will be about this, because obviously the the idea of like already on on Twitter, you could see that the initial responses were right wingers talking about how terrible it was for uh for him to impersonate a veteran like as if as if he was doing it in order to get an upgrade on a plane or like to cut to the front of the line at jack in the box or something like i mean he was doing it obviously in an artistic attempt to satirize people who are full of shit about their support for the troops and this is one of those situations where that they are just as they've got their holy grails just the way that campus leftists do like just as 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 a campus leftist would jump on you for accidentally misgendering a transgender person and calling him a her and not being quite jiggy with the the lingo the moment you start to talk about the troops the right goes absolutely crazy Every, everyone's got their their sore spots apart from sort of i suppose genuinely centrist free speech absolutists like bill maher but everybody hates bill maher for for exactly that reason so um, there was a guy talking about the same issue here. There was a guy who stormed off of CNN this week because they were having a conversation about this was before Trump made a Supreme Court pick, but they were talking about potential picks. And somebody made a point that, well, listen, there's this trend uh, happening with Republicans where they'll pick people who are a little too, you know, uber religious and a little too willing to let that seep into their judicial philosophy and you know you could cite hobby lobby as an example of that but uh at it, in the service of making this point this person said uh mentioned christian sharia and the response from a right-wing radio host named steve deese was to get incredibly outraged and then go on this you know minute and a half rant about how, you know, I come on this show and I'm willing to uh, try to have a high-minded discussion and then you're going to insult so many people by using the term Christian Sharia. And, uh, you know, frankly, I don't even, I don't think I need this. And then he ended up, you know, taking his microphone off and storming off the set. And then, you know, the point that the guy made is actually a totally reasonable point. And to use the term Christian Sharia, okay, you might not like the term, but He's making a logical point that you need to address if you're a serious person and you want to have a political discussion. But well, no, you don't need to. Off. If you think it's ridiculous and that there's no no uh, similarity between re- religious fundamentalism in Christianity and religious fundamentalism in, in Islam, and I would probably actually make that point because no matter how crazy religious fundamentalist Christians become, they're nothing like ISIS. But if you want to make that point, then just make that point. Don't storm off a, a, a talk show. Yeah, and also Sharia in this sense is not like the literal meaning of it it's a stand in sure. for it, that's yeah. right it's a stand in for and this guy's too craziness. dense to get that yeah 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 that's <laughs> right uh let's talk about a couple a few substantive policy issues um because i i know it's it's getting late over there and i want to let you go but i, I don't want to just keep whining because i feel like so much of what i do is whine about how extreme both sides are so let's talk about can we talk about medicare um for a second medicare for all so i sure. i'm currently in australia i went and saw the doctor the other day uh, i can choose to either go to a doctor that uh, 
uh, where my Medicare card is it covers it completely. If I want to go to a doctor that's slightly well less busy and like a a really high end doctor, then I can choose to pay a supplement on on top of that, whatever that doctor wants to charge. So in this case, he charges fifty dollars over what the uh, what Medicare reimburses him for. But everything goes through, and this is true in Western European countries as well. Everything goes through my doctor, and I have no right to just. Uh, unilaterally declare that I want to go and see a specialist unless my doctor thinks that it's worth it. I have no right to automatically avail myself of whatever medical procedure I happen to think that I would like uh, unless my doctor uh, agrees. And my doctor is actually likely to consider the cost to the social system of his agreeing as part of his factoring in whether or not I should get such a thing. Now, when I was in the States... I was working at HuffPost Live, had great uh, health insurance, and one day there were, we got a group email saying that uh, there was a, an, a a massage company offering free massages on the fourth, fourth floor. So I went up and got a free massage, and they got me to fill out a little piece of paper and include my email address. And then I get a follow-up email saying, we think you'd be an ideal candidate for regular ongoing massage therapy. And I was like, I mean, I love getting massages, so that's fine. And I do have mild chronic uh, neck pain. So over the course of 11 weeks, I went to this place without ever having to see a doctor uh, in order to get, get approval to go there. And I never had to pay a copay. And a few months later, and they, would, they did a few different things to me, a massage, like put a little machine on my back, made me feel a bit better, like a warm blanket kind of thing. Uh, happy ending. Yeah, no, happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> happy ending. And uh, some weeks later, I got paperwork from my insurance company that said that I had been paying a copay at all of these places, but the company didn't care that I hadn't been because they still get the insurance rebate. And the total amount that had been billed was many, many, many thousands of dollars. I think it was like $11,000 or something (laughs) for, (laughs) right? And the insurance company had paid it. If you want Medicare for all, that shit's got to stop. Like there is, and and that is rationing, right? There is, that, that means that in order for me to get If I have a sore neck and I want a a massage and I feel that the massage makes it better, in the States, if you have good health insurance, you can get whatever the fuck you want and your insurance company will pay for it. Uh, And that's why insurance premiums are so high, largely. There's also no bargaining down of drug companies, which is a a whole other aspect we can talk about. But when you say Medicare for all, if you look at the cost of healthcare in America, and even the cost of Medicare, even though it's more efficient than private health insurance, it's still orders of magnitude more expensive per capita than healthcare is in other countries with inferior outcomes. If you simply opened up, a la Bernie Sanders, Medicare to everybody in America, I mean, the budget, it would be so costly, I just don't even believe Bernie's figures. You need to do it along with things that I think Americans find really uncomfortable and challenging, like death panels and and rationing, which is essentially what my GP does. What's your solution to that? So first of all, I just have to say I disagree with the premise. Um, If you look at the U.S. healthcare system, if we keep our current system in place over the next decade, it's projected to cost $49 trillion. If you scrap our system and do a Medicare for all system, it's projected to um, save $17 trillion. So it would cost $32 trillion. Um, Now, Why exactly is that the case? Uh, My guess is it has a lot to do with the fact that there's an unnecessary for-profit cash-sucking middleman in the middle. Well, literally, I said it's a middleman. Of course, it's in the middle. (laughs) Uh, You could tell it's late. (laughs) Um, And... Yeah, so but hang on, Kyle. Let me just pull you up on that mm-hmm. because when sure. when when people on the left uh, bandy around these figures, and I I have no way of knowing whether or not where those figures come from or whether they're true, but I, let's assume I can email true. them to you if you'd like. Um, I, I can pull them up now. I, I, like. I take your word that some think tank has has calculated this. Part of the problem is that in America at the moment, the healthcare system is incredibly expensive and wasteful, but it's but the costs are diversified throughout a lot of different actors. So that forty nine trillion dollars that is projected to cost the American healthcare industry is born in part by individuals paying copays, in part by insurance uh, companies out of pocket, in in part by hospitals losing money on emergency uh, uh, treatment that they never get reimbursed for from people who show up in the emergency room who don't have insurance, in part by Medicaid, in part by Medicare, in part by the Veterans Affairs Association, uh, and the seven and. So it's very hard to say, yeah, but look at all this money that we as a country are wasting. We're going to save money if instead we move to this other system wherein all of the money is born in this massive new federal 
uh, budget expense, which would cost a lot more. Medicare for all would cost a lot more from the government than the government is currently spending on Medicare. Oh, sure. No, no, no. I'm not disputing that. I mean, that's a given. But, you know, the the idea is if I can if I can take your the amount you pay in your premium and then, OK, well, now forget your premium. Now you have no premium and it just comes out of your taxes. Your taxes go up, but it's a net savings. Mm. That's what we're talking about here when I say, you know, you the we save 17 trillion dollars. Um, but also, I mean, look, there's just run of the mill price gouging is a huge issue mm. in the United States. I mean, I've covered so many stories where I mean, we're talking about hospitals that give people tissues and call them cough suppressant aids and charge them $95. Mm, mm. I mean, just really preposterous stuff. And it's just like, it's basically like the unregulated wild, wild west. When no, you but that's what I'm saying. Like you would need to have, you would need to ta- to do all of this other stuff in order to have Medicare for all. And like one of the, you're just mentioning one of the big ones. It's both, it's not just price gouging. It's also that the Republicans have passed laws saying that it's illegal for Medicare to bargain with drug companies over the amount that it's willing to pay for drugs. So a drug sure, company sure, that. Yep. or a medical provider simply bills whatever they want and the public purse has to pay for it. I mean, that's not sustainable. Yep. In countries like Australia, oh, yeah, in, in Australia, there are things, there are medical advisory boards that are appointed by uh, the government and they're professionals who look at whether or not a drug is worth the quality of life adjusted year uh, that it adds to a person's life. And if it's not, then it won't get funded and you'll need to get private insurance to um, to pick up that tab. But if you maintain the status quo in America where everything gets funded at any price that a drug company or a hospital wants to charge for it, I can't see how Medicare for All works. Yeah, no, I uh, I agree. You have to marry Medicare for All with these reforms that you're talking about. And that's probably one of the most important ones. Um, and, you know, hey, Bernie's proposed that as well. So... Yes, it's it's actually it's a very complex issue, and for for the left to throw around this term, and I'm more guilty of it than anybody else to just casually throw around like, well, Medicare for all, and that's the answer. There's a lot that goes with that, so right. you know, it's a very and, and you, complex and you piece of legislation. You appreciate that a lot of those things that go with that will be very easy for the right to demonize. We oh, just saw course, it with the de- dude, death panels conversation, right? right? I think the right is masterful at demonizing anything. I mean, you could take an idea that's not, literally uh, universal background checks in the U.S. are ninety-three uh, percent popular, fav- guns, uh, favorable. Yeah, and um, and Mitch McConnell bragged about killing a watered-down background check bill the last time this issue came up under Obama. So I think the right they have no shame. Uh, when I say the right, I mean elected Republican politicians, not necessarily average Joe mm. Republicans, but um, they'll demonize anything. So them, you know, giving them fodder uh, to do that, uh, to me, it's a non-issue because they'll do it anyway. And I'm uh, of the school of thought that we're going to counterattack. But right. I do take your point, and you're totally right when you say this is a super complex issue, and it w- it'll take a lot of time, a lot of effort to to come up with all the solutions, and it won't be perfect, and it'll be, you know, something that will have to be tweaked as time goes by to fix new problems that pop up. It just depresses me that our focus is that, uh, A, these are really complicated issues that the layperson can't be expected to fully understand and can be expected to be reliably scared out of their pants about by unscrupulous people who want to scare them out of their pants about them for political gain. And that we don't have a way, not just in America, but really in any Western democracy, to start focusing on things beyond the next electoral cycle and educating ourselves about things in in deep ways. Let's wrap with this. Are you fundamentally optimistic or fundamentally pessimistic about the sort of medium to long term fate of Western liberalism and and democracy? And if you're and why? Uh, I have a rather pathetic answer to that. I don't know. I really don't know how I feel Um, in in some moments, I feel very pessimistic, and I think climate change is probably the biggest one on that front, where it strikes me that we are so far behind where we should be, and you know, with Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement and 
even that wasn't strong enough. And now we've said no to that. It was, so it's like, oh my mm. goodness, we're so far away from where we need to be. And oh, I'm so I glad le- you said that as well, because that, that one thing that shits me about uh, when Republicans will go on talk shows and they'll say, the Paris Climate Agreement did barely anything. Like, we, it was a bad agreement. We should have junked it because it, you know, it wouldn't have, it would have changed the, the warming of the earth by like a quarter of a degree. And we're already expecting three degrees of warming. And I'm like, well, yeah, the reason it was shooting so fucking low is because people like you <laughs> Im- impede any serious attempt to do something about it. You can't say we shouldn't do anything, and then when we do do the most that we can, which is still tiny, say it's too tiny and we shouldn't bother doing it. Sorry, minor, yeah, minor have, rant over. You have to remember, the reason it, it was called the Paris Climate Agreement and it wasn't a treaty is because of Republicans in the United States of America and Congress who rejected it. So... Yeah, they're as extreme as it gets on that issue, and that's there's a hefty amount of pessimism in me when I look at that. Mm. Now, on the flip side, um, I am a, I am somewhat optimistic because when I look at the opinion polls, now granted I know we already discussed earlier you're not as big of a fan of opinion polls as I am, but I see them shifting in a way that's positive. So this this is what I say about Americans when if you. I think the American people, it's fair to call them ignorant. So they might not, you know, they they don't know historical facts. There's, you know, a pathetically low percentage of Americans who could tell you like any Supreme Court justice or even the vice president. But I also, I don't think they're stupid. I think that they're not masochistic. They don't think like, oh, how can I support politicians and policies that will actively screw me and my family over and this country over. So I think that the American people are actually trying to strive to create a better country. It's just that our leaders are terrible at representing us. Um, I think that corruption is probably the biggest issue because it's the issue that pollutes all other issues. So I think I I have faith in uh, the American people and their opinions and the fact that we're moving in the right direction on that front. So now it's just a matter of taking those feelings that we have and basically forcing our politicians to do the will of the people. And so I think that I'm somewhat optimistic because, you know, 80% of the American people want to raise the minimum wage. 60% now want Medicare for all. Um, You know, taxing... uh, Free college, tuition-free college, 58% of the American people uh, want that. Taxing Wall Street, that number is hovering around 60% as well. Mm. Uh, legalizing marijuana, uh, 60% of the American people. So, you know, you go down the list and I'm, I go, okay, I agree with that one, 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 I agree with that one. So it's just a matter of taking this popular will, which is largely correct, and getting the politicians to do what they're supposed to do in what's supposed to be a representative democracy. Mm. Well, exactly. It's, and supposed to be a representative democracy. Well, it is. Look, it is a representative democracy, but supposed to be a democracy <laughs> uh, period is a little bit trickier because we live in a, in, a, in a situation where the occupant of the White House got fewer votes. The House of Representatives, a majority of Americans voted for Democrats in the House of Representatives and will continue to do, it, do so again for sure in November, but may not even win back the House. And the Senate uh, it represents, you know, the majority of people who the Senate, who senators represent, voted for Democrats in the Senate as well, but Republicans control it. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing. This rep, the representative aspect of representative democracy. But I hope I, I, I would like to share your optimism, and I think I just constitutionally deep down do uh, share your optimism that there are ways that we've America has a long history and has had a lot of tricky moments. Uh, and just because the the last tricky moment was 50 years ago and has escaped most of our living memory doesn't mean that we won't um, find ways of countering these new challenges. Uh, no one ever lost money. Uh, no one ever made money betting against the United States, as they say. So fingers crossed. Yeah, well, the Nazis have been defeated by <laughs> by exactly. the U.S., by, you know, yeah. U.K., Russia, everybody. So it's, uh, if, if the previous generation could beat the Nazis... Yeah, we should be yeah. able. We should be <laughs> be able to. Yeah, we Trump. should be able to get our shit together <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> Kyle, uh, it's good to talk to you. Thanks uh, so much for being on the show. Thanks, man. It was a pleasure. Nice talking to you too.